Okay, what's up everybody? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over uh, week 12 here. Early projections and ownership. Uh, it is Wednesday, and we've had some news come out this morning about uh, a couple of starting quarterbacks that have gotten benched. Um, one of them in our first game here. We'll get to that in a sec. Um, quickly though, some housekeeping. Um, I will not be putting up projections for the Thanksgiving slate. Um, we've got a, a lot of noise in, in the numbers and with a, a slate that's spread out or as spread out as the, um, Thanksgiving slates are, you know, there's six and a half hours or whatever in between the first and the, and the, um, last games, um, makes it a little difficult to get some pretty reasonable ownership figures, um, and we will probably, you know, with it being a short week, uh, still have some um, some inactive questions for uh, some of the later games. So that's going to make it pretty hard projections-wise and ownership-wise to, to really get a, a good figure out. Um, that said, I, I believe Sheets is, is putting some stuff out, um, and the... For the most part, um, using Saber Sims ownership projections or even Cheese's ownership projections, uh, those are going to be, you know, they're, they're good numbers, of course, right? Um, but uh, so, yeah, just so everybody's aware, um, not going to be putting out the Thanksgiving slate uh, projections. We'll just stick to the main slate. Um, and we've got kind of a, a well a, a little bit more of a balanced week um four games in the afternoon now uh, they're still uh pretty heavy on the morning stuff really wish they'd sort this out a little bit but it's not as bad as the nine three split or nine two split or, or whatever that the nfl normally pulls um that said we've uh similar to last week we've got some kind of fishy totals uh, a lot of them are, are pretty low uh now that we're here in, in late november um, and, and getting into the latter half of the season. Um, but I do think there are a couple of pretty decent spots that we might be able to get to. Um, maybe some, some hidden spots or some overlooked spots. I mean, just kind of as usual, right? Um, we can go through the games and, and go through the players uh, and, and really find spots that are playable pretty much in, in every game. Um, so that said, let's uh, let's kind of get into it. Houston and Miami, uh, starting off here. This number is sitting at uh, pretty large, uh, about Miami 13 right now. And um, I mean, I've got to be honest. I, I made the number a little bit lower. I think Houston could very well be a, a live dog to cover a, a really big number in this game. Um, Miami's defense is terrible like really, really terrible. And as I alluded to, uh, Davis Mills has been benched. So it's Kyle Allen season. And Kyle Allen um, actually isn't horrific. I mean, he's not, he's really not uh, a starting quarterback kind of caliber um, anymore, but he's a capable backup. And I think what we've seen from Davis Mills this season is really just no upside in uh, avoiding pressure and no upside in the passing game. So um, that said, I'm not sure that Kyle Allen really offers a whole heck of a large upgrade necessarily. Um, but you know, he he does have a, a a little bit more in the tank than Davis Mills. So um, as you can see here, we don't even have him in the projections yet. That's because none of the models anywhere have adjusted to that news yet. So um, Keep this in mind when you're going over this game and, or, or looking at these early figures here. Um, this is all going to change. And, I mean, this is Houston. They're still not going to get played uh, across the industry. So, um, but that said, with Kyle Allen, it's a, it's a fundamental shift in how the offense is going to operate. And with Kyle Allen at 4,800 over here on DK, um, I don't think that's the worst mega punt in the world in, in deep tournament teams if you're trying to get to some some really expensive players elsewhere. Um, 
may have something like a Jamar Chase back this week who's expensive. If you want to play some uh, Christian McCaffrey, he's very expensive. You know, those kinds of plays. Um, it, it could be necessary to drop down a little bit uh, in your stack here. And, and Houston does offer that, and the spot is, is pretty good. Like I said, um, Miami's got one of the worst pass defenses in the NFL, and I've mentioned it several weeks in, in a row now that their offense, while super potent, uh, we could be seeing a little bit of uh, maybe some smoke and mirrors in that it's not just the offense that's responsible for their offense scoring all those points, right? It could very well be due to some of their um, their defensive sort of susceptibilities and and tendencies, right? So um, Houston has played some pretty close games all season. Over the last couple of weeks, um, you know, maybe maybe they're <laughs> kind of getting a little uh, little little tired of getting beat up um, and losing close games. Uh, so last week, right, they uh, they got beat up pretty good. Um, that said, um, Damian Pierce, his ownership has really come down at least so far um, compared to the last several weeks that we've seen. We've seen him in the 20s uh, or even north of that. Um, 11% is probably warranted for how capable this offense is in general um, and the workload that he gets. At 6,100, is probably a little aggressive um, given a, just a mid-teen sort of projection now. But, um, you know, point per dollar value-wise, with a 10 12% ownership, give or take, is is still perfectly okay. Um that said, in the passing game, if we do want to get to a little bit of Kyle Allen, I think some Brandon Cooks now down in the low 5Ks is still worth considering. Um, he's still the number one receiver here, but don't forget about Nico Collins either at 4,100. He could be a deep tournament play or kind of a flex play if you're considering that um, because my uh, Houston's defense is still pretty bad, right? And Miami can score, and they will score. Like I said, they're laying a huge number here. Um, so by all expectations of the market, um, Miami's just going to blow the doors off here. So um, it could be an interesting play to get to some Nico on the other side uh, or some Brandon Cooks on the other side because they're they're going to have to throw the ball. And with the quarterback change, I think they're going to be looking to mix up the offense a little bit and try to get a, a bit more dynamic here. So I uh, don't think Brandon Cooks or Nico Collins at these price tags are necessarily unplayable. Um, but I think they're uh, that they, I think it's warranted to, to keep them in your pool. Um, Damian Pierce at 61. As I said, I'm not sure if there's a ton of actual value at this price, not underpriced. Um, for the workload potentially, but uh, Miami's certainly just more attackable through the air as they are a pass funnel defense. So um, I would rather get to the passing game here, but I think a one-off here of a Damian Pierce, Brandon Cooks, or Nico Collins are really all warranted. Uh, 2,700 Jordan Akins I don't think is horrendous, um, but again, they, they've got three tight ends here that they use with Catoriano and O.J. Howard. So I would be careful with that. On the other side, with Miami, um, if you are stacking the Dolphins, uh, it's the usual suspects, right? Tyreek and Jalen Waddle. But we saw last week, uh, or in their last game, that Je both Jeff Wilson and Raheem Moster kind of went off. And this is one of the best spots, if not the best spot, depending on what metrics you're looking at. Um, in the NFL for the run game. So I think both Jeff Wilson and Raheem Mostert once again in play. Um, neither of them really seeing a lot of, of steam just yet, but I think this is a pretty damn good spot. Uh, 59 and 5,700 respectively. Would prefer if they're a little bit cheaper, but I think both are, are certainly playable. And of course we can get to Jalen Waddle and Tyree Kill. They're a very pass-heavy offense. So um, you can certainly get to them if you'd like. At two at 6,900, I think we're sacrificing a little bit at this price tag um, due to a little bit of, well, I would say a lack of rushing upside. Um, 
but 6,900 if you're stacking Tyreek and, and Waddle with him or, or even some Mike Kosicki teams at 3,500, uh, don't think it's horrible um, to mix him in. We did see last week or last game, maybe two games ago, it was the Trent Sherfield show. So don't forget about him uh, if you're finding trouble getting to Tyreek and Jalen Waddle at these price tags uh, with a Tua. Go ahead and mix in a Trent Sherfield. He certainly has some upside. Um, and this six-point aggregate projection is probably a l tick on the low side. So moving on. Um, Cincinnati and Tennessee. Cincinnati won pretty much all the money last week. At least Joe Burrow did. Um, 6,700 Burrow is still playable. Uh, he is they're, – they're a pass-heavy offense. And – with Joe Mixon having gone out last week with a concussion, um, it turned into this Maje Piran show. Uh, it wasn't so much in the rush game necessarily. Obviously, he scored three times or whatever it was, uh, so there's a little bit of noise there. Um, but if it, did, it was more so in the uh, in the passing game, and they, and they still threw the ball to Tyler Boyd and T Higgins. And and Samaje Piran actually caught one of those touchdowns, I believe. Could have been two. Um, so if you know, we got to keep an eye on Joe Mixon. If uh, if he is out this week, I think Piran is is playable at 56. Um, probably not a priority because uh, Tennessee's rush defense isn't necessarily where we want to attack most often. It's it's the pass defense. Um, and that said. You know, Cincinnati's pass game is is definitely their strength. Um, it's a pretty dynamic shift here from Mixon to Pirine, but once again, uh, Pirine is is perfectly capable. Uh, are seeing Jamar Chase practice this week, as I alluded to a little bit earlier. He's at 7,600. Um, if he plays, I I think that T Higgins at 69 is probably a bit overpriced. Tyler Boyd at 59 is probably okay. Um, so we'll have to keep an eye on, on what since he's going to do here. I think the price tags are, are fine here. I think there's, there's upside as you can see here with Jamar Chase right now, we've got uh, some pretty low aggregate projections. So don't pay much attention to this, um, this early in the week. More so, we're just trying to kind of flesh out some, some decent spots so far. So, uh, this number will probably double, <laughs> I would guess if he plays, um, in this spot, because this is a really, really good good opportunity for the Cincinnati offense. Um, that said, on the other side, Tennessee, I think, is also pretty live here. T uh, Cincinnati's just laying one, one and a half in this game. Uh, pretty low total again, 42 and a half, 43 uh, is where we're sitting in the markets right now. So, um, and Tennessee, I believe, has won seven of eight. Uh, and they're just kind of doing Tennessee things here in late November and, and into December. Really leaning on the run game and opportunistic in the pass game when they need to be and really capitalizing um, on good matchups. So in their last outing, I, mean, I think Tannehill is, is still a little bit hobbled, so would probably uh, be careful getting to him at 5,400. Um not going to project all that well naturally as Ryan Tannehill uh, really never does. So, um, but at 15 points, I mean, he certainly has 25 point upside. So if you're stacking Tennessee here, um, probably not one of my favorite plays of the week, but it's definitely in play in, in deep tournaments. Um, Traylon Burks is back and he's a 4,200. I think this is still a perfectly playable price. Robert Woods at 47, probably stay off that. Um, don't forget about guys like Nick Westbrook Akine down here. Uh, they'll also use him in the passing game. Austin Hooper has seen an uptick in workload over the last couple of weeks. He caught two balls, um, or two scores last week, rather, in the Green Bay game on that Thursday night. And that could sort of suggest that um, Tennessee is, is more willing to use him a in the passing game a little bit more as we move throughout the season. Um, we have seen Derrick Henry. Obviously, the the offense runs through him. 8,300, I think this is perfectly fine. Um, and at 
12 15% ownership. You could play Derrick Henry pretty much every week in all but the most terrible of spots. And this one doesn't really qualify as such. So uh, I think he's perfectly in play. Um, that said, not my favorite offense to get to necessarily. Uh, I don't think we're going to see, um, you know, a, this total kind of blast through 50 or, or anything necessarily. Um, but there's plenty of talent on this field for this to be a, a little bit sneaky for sure. Uh, favorite plays here would be the Cincy passing game and one-off runbacks of like an Akine or a Traylon Burks. Um, but if you do want to stack Tennessee, I think the passing game is okay to get to. Ryan Tannehill, Burks, and Akine, maybe just playing Tannehill with one of them. And you can even throw in a Derrick Henry. They're, they're, they're using him a little bit in the passing game as well. So increases his upside for sure. At uh, And at 8,300, you you kind of need that. So um, I think both sides are playable here. Not a, a focus for me necessarily, but uh, definitely still in play. Uh, moving on, Baltimore and Jacksonville. Um, this is a really kind of a weird game. Um, you know, at first glance, you, you'd kind of assume that Baltimore would just blow the doors off of Jacksonville. And, you know, I, I went through a, a bunch of numbers and, um, you know, this in the betting markets, this number is sitting at about Baltimore minus four, four and a half right now. And I think that number is a bit too high. Um, I made it a little shorter. Uh, I made it Baltimore three. And that's not to say that, you know, half a point or, or even a full point in the NFL is necessarily a lot of value in the betting markets. But um, when you're getting a full point compared to your number in the markets, um, and you're considering betting a, a home dog catching those points, um, I think there's maybe a little bit more hidden value in that regard. So that said, how does that help us in DFS? Um, well, the total, first of all, is sitting about 45, 45 and a half, um, kind of middling, right? And I think that offers maybe some opportunities at an under, to be quite honest, because neither of these offenses here, Baltimore and Jacksonville, are all that potent. Um, they really don't run, run a whole lot of plays. So stacks are kind of um, off the table. I mean, not totally off the table, but uh, they're much less likely to get there than some of the other offenses we've got available here. So um, obviously, if we are playing Baltimore, we know where the production is going to come from. It's Lamar, it's Mark Andrews, and it's pretty much it. Um, Kenyon Drake will get work, and he is going to lead the backfield, of course, um, but they've got 17 running backs that they use. And even one or two carries for each of them, Gus Edwards and uh, and Justice Hill, whoever else they, they bring up from the practice squad just to make our lives difficult. Um, even just a couple of carries from each of those guys cuts into Kenyon Drake's work. So uh, it's just something to be aware of when we're clicking the 5,700 for uh, for Drake over here. Um, so that said, favorite play here is definitely going to be Mark Andrews. Jacksonville is most susceptible in the passing game. But in general, Baltimore just doesn't throw the ball all that often. They're very balanced on offense. And as I mentioned, they, they don't run a whole lot of plays relative to the other teams in the slate. So um, you can always play Lamar, 8,000. I think that's still fine. Um, and my, my favorite stack here, if I were stacking them, would be Lamar and Mark Andrews. Uh, don't think... A Devin Duver Duvernay punt is is necessarily bad, but I think 4,700 price is probably a little aggressive here. Um, and like I said, be careful with some Kenyon Drake stuff at 57. Jacksonville's rush defense is is you know pretty solid. Um, they only give up about 4.4 yards per carry if memory serves. Um, and you know that's in the top third of the league in in rush defense. So uh, really not a whole lot of exploitable upside for the Ravens offense here necessarily. Um, Ravens defense 3700. I think they're probably too expensive. Uh, I think as I said, I I think Jacksonville is a live dog in this game. So um, generally when I've got that suspicion, I, I like to stay away from expensive defenses. So on the other side, if Jacksonville is live, um, unfortunately we can't really get to ETN. Uh, Baltimore's rush defense is also really, really good. Now, ETN doesn't need carries and doesn't need 
groundwork necessarily to get there because they do use him a lot in the passing game. And obviously with Etienne and Lawrence having gone to college together, they're very comfortable together in the backfield. So it's okay to get to some 6,700 ETN as the entire offense is still going to run through him. Um, I would say Baltimore is, is slightly more attackable through the air. However, 6,500 Christian Kirk is it, getting to the pretty aggressive zone here. So um, not really super excited about that. Um, I do still like Zay Jones. We've been playing him a lot over the last several weeks. He's still a good value down here in the, in the mid 4,000s. Um, fine point per dollar play. But uh, the projection, naturally, for a, a number two or really a number three um, option in the offense is always going to sort of lead to a, a pretty poor value play. So um, that said, Jacksonville is live, um, certainly live to, to cover four. If this number steams a little bit to four and a half or five, I think that's a pretty easy Jacksonville play, to be quite honest. Um, I mean, they could get beat by 30, who knows? But um, numbers-wise, I think that's a, a pretty strong play. That said, what we're going to see, we'll get to Kansas City in the last game, but uh, they're going to be the chalkiest defense, certainly, uh, with Matt Stafford questions. I think a really, really good Pivot is the Jaguars defense here at 2,500. Not going to project all that well, so you might have to force these guys in. But um, I think it's a pretty good play, and I think they're, outside of the Chiefs, under 3,000, one of the only maybe three or four defenses that could be playable uh, down there this week. So I think this is a really, really good pivot, and you're probably going to get some pretty low ownership on them. Uh, moving on, Tampa and Cleveland. I think this is a pretty good spot for for Tampa here. They're laying three and a half on the road uh, in Cleveland. Um, I made the number a little bit tighter than that, but uh, really not going to play games with Cleveland here. Uh, not running, rushing to the window to, to bet them necessarily. They're, they're pretty bad and they've underperformed really all season. Um, outside of their first maybe couple of drives every week, they don't show a whole lot of ability to adjust to game flow. Um, so their scripted plays that come out as the first 10 plays or first two drives, whatever they do, uh, are usually pretty efficient as they've had, you know, an entire week to, uh, to derive a game plan, right? But after that, they just kind of um, throw shit at the wall and, and hope it sticks, and it doesn't really most often. So um, really disappointing season from a lot of the the offense on the Cleveland side and same thing kind of with uh with Tampa here however over the last several weeks I think Tampa might be starting to figure it out a little bit um things have kind of calmed down for Brady at least in the media and whatnot so he's not having to deal with that nearly as much and I think it's allowing him to focus on football a little bit more and we've seen performances out of Tampa um you know a, a little bit more in line with what we expect, right? So now we're getting Tampa here and the most pass-heavy offense in the NFL uh, with a quarterback 5,800. Um, I think this is a really, really good play here. And Cleveland is attackable both on the ground and through the air. So um, I think with a, a balanced approach, the, the Buccaneers can really – Take it to Cleveland here, and I think uh, the Browns might have um, might have their hands full. So that said, 5800 this is one of the cheapest prices we've seen Brady in the last several years. Um, obviously, he's you know on the back end of his career here, but uh, still throwing the ball a lot, and still has plenty of weapons with Godwin, Evans, Fournette. We have to keep an eye on. Uh, he's got, I believe, a hit pointer, so he is still sore as of. I believe as of yesterday or as of today um, when news came out about that. So if he is out or hobbled at all, um, keep an eye on Rashad White. He had a really, really good outing in his in his last appearance, um, 15, 18 carries or something like that, and, and broke through 100 yards. So um, despite Tampa's offense not being all that rush heavy, there's still upside here um, in the run game for sure. They move the ball very well in the passing game down the field. And then, you know, Fournette, he's always had huge, huge touchdown equity. So 
what they end up doing is just giving him the football on the goal line, and all of a sudden he scores three touchdowns in the first half, and your day is over. Um, so something to be aware of with Rashad White. He's definitely capable as well. And like I said, this is a very good spot against Cleveland, whose defense is uh, certainly attackable uh, on the ground. Um, Julio, I'd probably stay off of, but he is one of these pieces, if you're stacking Brady, uh, that you can mix in. Um, Mike Evans and Chris Godwin both are obviously the preference. Um, Cameron Brait is, is, I mean, we're, we're not sure. Brait's been out the last couple of weeks, so it could be Kate Otten again. Uh, both of these guys as tight end plays are... are um, are certainly playable in in deeper tournament pools. Um, if you're getting to a, a good few Tom Brady teams, uh, that said, Tom Brady has always kind of been frustrating to play because uh, he's got 11 dudes that he throws the football to. Um, I mean, as we can see here, we got Russell Gage, Julio, Evans, Godwin, and b guys out of the backfield as well. So uh, he really, really spreads the ball around. And that often leads to some pretty frustrating days if you're just stacking one or two of these guys. So um, don't forget about just, you know, the option of playing Tom Brady naked. He's very well priced and this is still a capable offense with a lot of different um, a lot of different uh, guys to throw the football to. So that's definitely playable. And at low ownership, I think a, that's a. Uh, um, you know, a, a pretty warranted uh, lineup construction to consider. Uh, that said, if you do want to stack him, I think my favorite would be Chris Godwin. I really like this price tag for him in this spot at 6000 But I think Mike Evans uh, is absolutely playable as well. He's got a lot of touchdown equity, and this is really kind of why his price kind of hovers uh, still pretty high relative to the other guys in the team. So um, I think all options here for Tampa are playable uh, because I think Cleveland is probably going to give give up some points here um that said on the other side really not excited about Jacoby Brissett this week I think he's been playable the last couple of weeks um getting really bad defense but defenses but I'm not sure Tampa really falls into that same sort of category here uh Nick Chubb 7800 finally seeing his price come down a little bit um Tampa is a little susceptible I don't want I mean, they're, they're a middling rush defense, kind of a middling pass defense as well. But the overall upside for the Browns offense, as I mentioned, they're having trouble kind of adjusting to game flow and getting the football in the hands of their, their most um, explosive athletes. Outside of really Amari Cooper, who seems to catch two touchdowns every freaking week. Um so that said, if I am stacking Tampa, I would prefer to be running it back with Amari. I think 6400 is a pretty good price here. And you can once again play DPJ. I think he is borderline. I mean, maybe not even borderline. Yeah, I mean, he's been a cash play the last couple of weeks. And I think the volume there, um, at least given projected game flow here in this game against Tampa, is probably still going to be pretty solidified. So uh, 4,800, think this is a fine play. Once again, you may see 6, 8, could even see, you know, 9 or 10 targets and catch 7 balls. Upside, probably not there, but does have a little bit of touchdown equity. Um, and he could absolutely pop for, for 20 or so. And at 4,800, that's really all you need in tournaments. Um, 4,900 for Kareem Hunt seems to be getting less and less work uh, over the last couple of weeks could also just be due to game flow because the Browns are terrible. Uh, still think he is playable in passing um, related game scripts, and I think that's, that's perfectly fine. Guy is still a bowling ball, um, and yards after the catch for a running back is still pretty strong for him. Uh, David Njoku was back, 3,600. He looked pretty good. I think he's okay to get to uh, just kind of one of these l cheaper tight ends outside of the upper tier, um, you know, the Kelsey's, the Mark Andrews, the George Kittles this week that you can certainly mix in um, yeah, at 3,600. Brown's defense not touching at 2,700. I think they're probably going to get blown out here. So um, moving on, Chicago and the Jets, we got some questions here as well. Haven't heard much about Justin Fields and his shoulder. Um, there's been really conflicting reports as to whether he actually dislocated it or whether he just kind of tweaked it or sprained it or, or anything like that. So we're, we 
really haven't heard anything definitively just yet. And once again, this is uh, about midday on Wednesday. Now, the injury report, injury report um, does come out today, so keep an eye out for that if you're considering getting to fields again. That said, if he's got a a a bad shoulder, I mean, they'll probably just shoot him up and and let him go. Um, I'm not sure why. You know, if he's got a significant tweak here, um, playing him seems pretty asinine to me. But you know, what do I know? Um, if he is out, then we're likely to see Trevor Simeon. I don't have him over here in the projections just yet because, like I said, we don't have any confirmed news. So uh, he's at 4,900, but that doesn't make him playable at all. Um, the Bears' offense is going to be pretty much the exact same it was at, in the early part of the season with Trevor Simeon under center. So there's no rushing upside for him, and there's very little passing upside. Um, he is a capable backup, as he did – have a, a one or two seasons um, as a starter in the league, but uh, that doesn't mean he was good. So um, I think Chicago's offense here is is probably in a, a pretty bad spot. And even if Fields plays, I'd be very, very careful because um, even though it is his left shoulder, I believe, uh, not his throwing arm, it's still going to hamper his, his movement quite a bit and he'll be less inclined to be running around um, if he's got a you know a bum shoulder and and doesn't want to get hit so um, I have seen some pretty solid reports that are saying his uh, his shoulder is dislocated so that would suggest to me that he'll just be out um, if they play him this week even if it if, if it's just a kind of a sprain um, like I said that seems pretty ridiculous to me. So that said, uh, I would stay off of the entire Chicago offense here. Jets are actually laying, um, well, it opened at four. Uh, I made the number six. Um, I think it's, it's steamed up to six now that we've seen some of the, the noise come out, uh, about or surrounding Justin Fields. So, um, by all accounts in the marketplace, the the Jets are are looking like a, a pretty decent play here. Uh, if you can get a lower number on the Jets um, anywhere in the betting markets, I think that's probably a pretty good play. Um, at six, maybe not, but um, you know because we do have questions as to well, not really, not no questions. Zach Wilson got benched, right? So um, it's actually going to be the Mike White show. He is once again not in the projections here because nobody's adjusted to it just yet. But uh, he's at 4,900. Um, really not a lot of history in the NFL for Mike White. Did get into a few games last season, but really not a, a large sample to speak of. I believe he went to Western Kentucky. Um, I mean, I could be making this up. But uh, not a lot of upside for the Jets passing game, no matter what. So I think Matt, Mike White can just kind of stay off of our, our radar, uh, even though Chicago's defense is really, really bad. Um, that said, I'd, I'd go right to the running game here. You could consider playing some some Garrett Wilson. 4300 is a really, really good price here for him. Um, I think that's, you know, for a number one wide, wide receiver, um, you know, like you're not going to find a cheaper price. So that said, his ownership is coming in um, pretty high at the moment, which I think is fine. I think you can mix him in uh, if you want to get super crazy and throw in a Mike White with him. I, I mean... It's probably like the upside's probably not there, but because um, you have to imagine that they're likely to just r try and rely on the run game here, um, and and hand it off to Carter and and James Robinson. So um, that said, these two guys are going to split time 54, 5200. Don't think you can really play that necessarily, but uh, either one of them could certainly pop off against Chicago here. Um, Jets defense probably going to see some steam as well one of the more expensive defenses you can get to at 3,300. I think that's perfectly fine to play. Uh, at When I was going through the slate initially, um, they kind of jumped out as a pretty good spot, really only if uh, in the event that the fields is out. Um, I don't really want to mess with them at this price necessarily if fields plays, uh, even if he is hobbled. Um, and I think that's probably 
pretty much it. Maybe you could throw in a Tyler Conklin again, 3,100. Don't think that's horrific necessarily. Okay, moving on. I'm kind of yapping here. It's probably going to be another full hour, uh, I would guess here, guys, uh, as we just kind of talk through things. Uh, Atlanta and Washington. Really like this spot for Washington. I think this is a one of the spots that uh, I alluded to in the beginning that we can, can that we could get to that's probably overlooked. Um, Atlanta certainly on on one side, it like they just want to run the football. Uh, I think Mariota has been kind of playable. He did pop for a little bit, uh, maybe 25 points or something last week, um, or maybe the week before, but. In, in good spots, um, the Atlanta passing game has been playable. Uh, Drake London gets a lot of work in the red zone, and at least up to now, Kyle Pitts was certainly playable as well, but he's done. So you know, where is all of this uh, target share going to go? Well, it's probably just going to go to the running game where they'd prefer to go anyway. So um, Demir Bird and Oli Zacchaeus here, these are playable pieces. Um, McCole Pruitt is probably going to, to lead the tight end room, but I would imagine they'll just use all three of these guys down here, um, Ferkser, Hess, and Pruitt in in a timeshare. So don't really think it's uh, very warranted to be getting to the tight end room from the Falcons. Um, in a running back room, Cordero Patterson, uh, he's getting plenty of work, and he, as we saw last week, he's still returning uh, special teams for them, at least kickoffs. So um, if you want to play something like an Atlanta and Falcon or an, an Atlanta defense and a Cordero Patterson, um, last week showed that that can't really be ignored. Uh, this week necessarily, I'm not sure that it's it's great because those types of, of plays, you know, Cordero Patterson, he's not just a, a flex play, right? He's the number one running back. Um, he has plenty more equity than than just special teams um but that said if we're chasing Cordero Patterson in this spot because Washington's run defense is actually you know one of the better units in the league uh it's it's probably you know we're we are chasing a little bit um if we if we play some Cordero Patterson Falcons teams here that said 2900 for the Falcons against a um, you know, pretty mediocre offense over here against Washington. It's probably not the worst play in the world. Um, I think best way I'd like to attack this would be just singleton pieces in the receiving core. Um, probably just Drake London, 4900 for him. It's a really, really good price. Uh, as you can see here, we've got Kyle Pitts even projected with ownership coming in. This is going to change. So ignore this for now. Um, and... You know, check check back later in the week when we have some updated numbers. Um, on the other side, uh, for Washington, I think I think this is a pretty good spot. Like I said, um, I think we can get to Taylor Heineke at 5,300. Um, Washington doesn't throw the ball a whole hell of a lot, but Atlanta really, really gives it up in the passing game. So uh, I think this is a really strong spot for Terry McLaurin at 5,800. Love the price. I like the ownership so far at 14%. Um, I think this should this should be probably double this, given the the upside here. Um, if they throw him the football and I mean, the, the opportunities are, are definitely going to be there for him this week. So like some Taylor Heineke, 5,300, I think there's a, a good bit of upside for him to pop for 25 um, at, at very low ownership. Um, Antonio Gibson and Brian Robinson, they're, they're sharing time. Both of them are getting carries, and it's really only Gibson in the passing game. So if anybody, he's really the most playable Um even though they they really want to try and mix in Brian Robinson in obvious rushing situations, right? Um, now that said, Atlanta's defense, you know, once again is most attackable through the air, so um, you can play some Gibson at 5400, and we're seeing him, you know, the market kind of steam him a little bit so far as well. So I um, think it's fine. Don't forget about Logan Thomas, Jahan Dotson necessarily or Curtis Samuel uh, there's going to be some opportunities here for Washington to get over the top and 
these guys are, are cheap, and um, certainly a Jahan Dotson or Curtis Samuel can pop for uh, you know 60 and a score or something, and, and you're kind of off to the races. So um, really kind of overlooked and, and hidden spot for, you know, outside of Terry McLaurin, who gets played every week, uh, for the other parts of the passing game, Heineke, Samuel, Jahan Dotson, even some Logan Thomas at 3,000 flat. I think this is pretty decent play for the commanders really all around. 3,600 for their defense is also okay. Um, you know, this total sitting just 43 or so. Um, I think I'd probably prefer to just get up to the Broncos, who we'll talk about in the next game at 3,800, or get down to the Jets or something like that, uh, if I were considering this price range. So on to Denver, and uh, man, this team is depressing. Um, stepped on the, uh, the the Denver offense landmine once again, and um, I think it's this week finally where I'm going to have to hop off. Um, I'll probably still have some just uh, because if I miss it, I'm going to be really, really mad. But, um, I mean, the, the the upside just is not there. They've got the, you know, perhaps in a, in the second week of, of Clint Kubiak calling plays for them, um, they may have a little more continuity, but, man, they look terrible. Their clock management is terrible. Um, it, it just looks like the entire offense is wholly disinterested in, in playing football. Um, including Russ. I mean, he, he just looks really, really bad. Uh, I think he's very frustrated, as is the rest of the, the offense here. So, um, you know, if you are playing some of the Broncos, I think this is an all right spot to get to. Now, Carolina's got a pretty decent pass defense. They're more attackable, however, on the ground. So if we are getting the Broncos offense, I really like Latavius Murray, to be quite honest. At, at 5,000, prefer he were under 5K, but um, he's going to lead the running back room this week since they cut Melvin Gordon. Um, Marlon Mack is going to back him up. They have Divina Zigbo currently on the practice squad. They may call him up just, just in case. Um, but Marlon Mack will be the number two here. He has a, I, I don't believe Marlon Mack's even seen a snap yet this season. So um, it will be Lat Murray. And Lat Murray, as long as he doesn't get hurt, can ha- handle a... Uh, an RB1 type of workload if they give it to him. Um, that said, they're probably going to try and stay pretty balanced here, given that they're they're missing a lot of pieces in the receiving core. Uh, not sure about Judy just yet. He may still be out. Um, Kendall Hinton could still be in play, 3,700. And, and certainly Cortland Sutton back at 5,600. These guys are still playable as one-offs. I think they're very hard to get to, though, uh, in stacks, despite a 5,400 price tag for Russ Wilson. Really, really strong there. But once again, the offense is just totally out of sorts, and they look horrific. Um, but if we are getting to some pieces, I think there's there's touchdown equity for Lat Murray, and I think there's... Uh, he can reach 100 yards uh, in this spot, may, maybe catch a couple balls and get in the end zone, and I think that's okay at 5,000. Um, probably questionable in tournaments at that price tag um, due to the general lack of upside of the Broncos' offense, but it's still okay. It is still playable. He could he could pop you know for 22, 24, or something like that, and that's really all you need at that price for a running back. Um, on the other side. Carolina, I mean, I don't want anything to do with the Denver defense here. Um, you know, I really like them, as I kind of alluded to. At, they're at 3,800. I would like playing them in this spot. Uh, they're a little expensive, and I do have maybe some trepidations with their their pressure, their pressure metrics and their quarterback hurry metrics and all of that kind of jazz. But um, this is Carolina. Their offense is awful. And... I mean, it looks like it's going to be Darnold. So, Darnold is capable um, at 40. I mean, we're not playing him because Denver is more attackable on the ground. So, of, of anybody on the offense, you want to play Deontay Foreman. 5,500, I think this is an okay price as well. Uh, Denver is laying two and two and a half right now on the road, which I think is kind of aggressive. Um, I did make them the favorite, but I didn't make him a two and a half point favorite. So, um there could be a little bit of uh, exploitability in that regard because uh, we've seen, for example, Josh Jacobs kind of tear apart the Denver rush defense 
um, in in both of their meetings this season. So not totally out of the question that Deontay Foreman pops here at, at 5,500 uh, for 100 yards and a score or, or a couple scores or something like that. Uh, very well within range. Don't particularly want to be playing the Panthers defense, but once again, this is the Denver offense, and they're awful. So 3000 think it's it's perfectly playable price. Seems fine as of now at, um, you know, a, a two-and-a-half-point per dollar play and, you know, 20-ish value play, give or take. I think that's perfectly fine. Um, as I mentioned, don't really want anything to do with the passing game. If we are getting there, it, it would just be DJ Moore. Uh, Terrace Marshall Probably has a little bit of upside here at 3,900, but it it's not. Um, you know, for example, the reason I don't want to attack the Denver pass defense, even though uh, Devontae Adams tore him apart last week, Devontae Adams is is twice as good or more than all of these guys like put together, right? So, um, you know, DJ Moore is not Devontae Adams, and he's not going to like Pat Sertan can win the DJ Moore matchup. It's much less likely that he can win the Devontae Adams matchup. So, um, you know, that said, I don't think 3,900 Terrace Marshall is, is horrific. Uh, moving on to Vegas in the afternoon games, try and get through this um, relatively quickly. But here's Vegas once again. Um, you can play Derek Carr 5,700 with Devontae Adams um, at 86. They could perfectly reasonable because I think there's going to be you know, a good few points in this game. Um, as of right now, I believe, sorry, I'm just kind of scrolling through here on the side. I believe Seattle's laying points and it's, it's a pretty stiff number. As a matter of fact, um, it opened four. I made it a little bit higher to be, to be honest. I think Vegas is terrible. Uh, their their offense is really really exploitable here, and certainly their pass or excuse me their defense is really exploitable, uh, and their pass defense is certainly how you want to attack most often, um, and that's really Seattle's strength. Geno has been very good, so if I'm going to be attacking this game and expecting points, well it's going to be the usual suspects from Vegas, and it's going to be Adams, it's going to be Josh Jacobs, uh, Mac Hollins is an interesting sort of low to mid 4k piece that you can mix in we'll probably once again stay off of foster moreau uh just not enough of the same upside that darren waller offers um and at 12 percent ownership that's probably gonna that like that's that's too high for me personally um but you know if he fits and you click on him it's not the worst thing in the world um once again like getting to Devonte adams sub 15 or 20 percent ownership I think is warranted literally every single week and in every single matchup you can play him um since Josh Jacobs had another good week last week at 7700 and 20 percent ownership once again I mean they just feed him the football it's hard to ignore this um I don't think there's necessarily a whole lot of value in either that we can squeeze out of any one of these these numbers here 7700 or 19, 20% ownership. Uh, they're all kind of elevated, but you know that said, he's still certainly playable. And absolutely, if we're expecting points, he can pop for another 120 and two scores or something, catch five balls. So um, absolutely playable in a what's projected to be a, a pretty high-scoring game. Total sitting 48 right now. On the other side, um, if I were to play it, I think I'd probably prefer playing it. With Seattle's offense, um, but I'm really, I like both sides here. Um, certainly more expensive to get to Geno, DK, and, and lock it. Uh, you know, but Devontae Adams at 8,600 or whatever, I mean, you know, he, he kind of offsets that. So um, that's really who I would like. I'd probably stay off of the tight ends, but um, I think this is an interesting pivot spot. Noah Fant at 3,200 as opposed to, you know, at half the ownership of Foster Moreau on the other side. Basically the same price. I think that's fine. Um, both Metcalf and Lockett, really, really good spots here. And, you know, the, they're seeing about 10% ownership right now. And I think this is a this is pretty warranted. I think Geno could very well win the slate again. Um, I think we might have some weather concerns in this game, however, in Seattle. So keep an eye out for that. Um, 
you know, could drop the total a little bit, but as long as there's no wind, I think there's still going to be a, a lot of upside here for the Seattle offense. Kenneth Walker, he's been very, very efficient in the fourth quarter this season, I guess in the second half. Um, and, you know, so if we're playing Seattle, don't forget about him. 6,900 is a little elevated for him, but um, leading the running back room and you're really producing. So uh, at 20% ownership, I think it's probably high as well. Um, so not much value that we could squeeze out necessarily in with the running backs in this game. Josh Jacobs is 77 on the other side, but certainly playable pieces in stacks. Uh, go ahead and mix in all of these guys. Uh, there should be points in this game and you know, we can, we can play everybody. Um, now, likewise, in the Chargers Arizona game, market projecting that we're going to see points here as well. Um, so we have some questions on the other side. We'll get to Arizona in a sec, um, but it kind of dictates how we want to play this game from the Chargers' perspective, right? Questions being uh, Kyler Murray. Uh, we're not sure if he's going to play just yet. Now he was questionable going into the Mexico City game. Um, but it doesn't sound like there was really any chance for him to play. So who knows what kind of nonsense Cliff Kingsbury is, is going to try and, and pull this week. He could very well do the same thing. What we do have to keep in mind here is that Arizona has a bye coming up next week. So they have said that they don't want to push Kyler, and the team is terrible. They're whatever, last in the division or second to last in the division or something like that. Um they're not going anywhere this year and getting their franchise quarterback hurt um, would be a pretty bad look. And it could very well be a quick ticket for Cliff Kingsbury to out of town. So that said, they're probably going to sit him. That would be my guess. And it would be Colt McCoy again. And how this relates to the chargers, obviously, well, we need some, we need somebody that can move to football if we're expecting points here and Colt McCoy can, but he probably doesn't have the same sort of, um, the same sort of upside, I mean, he certainly doesn't have the rushing upside, but doesn't have the same sort of upside with the rest of the receiving core that Kyler does. Um, certainly after New Hopkins came back, right, we saw him just explode target share-wise, and Kyler just relied on him. Um, Kyler sort of keyed in on Zach Ertz at the beginning of the season without Nuke. So, Colt McCoy, however, has been spreading the ball around a little bit more, um, and that really kind of saps their upside as a total offense, right? So, or from a DFS perspective. Um, and that said, it's going to be really hard for them to move the football and score points because their rushing game is terrible, and, and Los Angeles is really most attackable on the ground. They've actually got an okay pass defense. So that said how do we really want to attack with the Chargers offense and against a, a pretty bad Cardinals defense? Um, well, once again, we need we need the Cardinals to score a little bit. So it, it kind of takes me off of full stacks here at these price tags. Um, Justin Herbert is, is fine. He's similar to Tom Brady, and you could play him naked because he's got a lot of guys that will throw the ball to. He's got a little bit of rushing upside down in the, in the red zone. Not a lot, but some. Um, Keenan Allen down here, 6,100. If he's full go, uh, I think this is a fantastic price. You know, we normally see Keenan Allen up in the mid sevens. Um, and for the workload that he gets when he gets a full snap share, uh, this price is way, way too cheap. So at 8% ownership or whatever, I think this is a smash play. Really, really like this a lot. Um, Mike Williams have to be careful with him. He's at 6,300. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. Um, we're, we're seeing sort of a price inversion here. And with Mike Williams, you know, it, it, if he's healthy, um, in healthy scenarios with both of these guys, there's no no way that Keenan Allen should be cheaper than Mike Williams, right? So there's value that we can attack in that regard alone. If Mike Williams is out, he tweaked his ankle again this last week, only played like, I don't know, 15 snaps or something. If he is out, then it's the Josh Palmer show once again who blew up on Sunday Night Football against the Chiefs. So 5400 for Palmer, I think that's a really good price too. Um, 
once again, hard to kind of get to full stacks because we need Arizona to score, but think this is playable. Uh, obviously, you could play Eckler literally every single week. Um, he doesn't need a whole hell of a lot of rushing upside. And Arizona's rush defense is pretty good, one of the better units in the league. But he catches so many balls out of the backfield that, you know, it, it's Eckler. It's kind of whatever. Go ahead and play him. Um, Chargers defense also in consideration and at 3,300. If we see the Jets defense at 3,300 as well, steam a little bit. Uh, Chargers could be a pivot because they're laying, uh, what, four, four and a half in this game as well. And if it is Colt McCoy, um, you know, Chargers defense could have a little bit of upside in that scenario. Um, not air about Arizona. Um, so on the other side, if we are playing Chargers or playing this game, trying to seek out some points, um, 5,100 is a pretty good price for Colt McCoy. Now, uh, I have suggested that, um, you know, he's going to spread the ball around quite a bit and might not be, you know, 30 point upside for him. Um, so I'd also kind of prefer to play these guys just kind of as one-offs. 7,700 for New Hopkins. Uh, I think this is a good spot. He dudded against the 49ers, but that's 49ers. This is the Chargers, and their pass defense is markedly worse than San Francisco's. So uh, you can get to Nuke. You pro he'll probably see, you know, again, another 10, 12 targets in this game. And at 7,700, he's certainly got the upside. Um, James Conner, however, at 6,600, really intriguing price. I think it's probably a little high for his role in the offense and how good Arizona's rush offense really is. But 6,600 is very intriguing because the Chargers' rush defense is terrible, one of the worst units in the league. So uh, I think this is playable uh, also as a one-off. Got to be careful with Rondale Moore. He tweaked a groin, I believe, um, and who actually saw all of the the target work well we don't have him over here and projected right now but it was our old friend AJ Green so if he um if Rondell Moore is out again I think getting to a 3400 AJ Green on DK is pretty warranted he saw eight or nine targets um and had a pretty solid workload there at 3400 I think that's pretty pretty damn good price would probably stay off of Trey McBride um, he's just not going to get the workload that Zach Ertz did. And uh, once again, 2700 for the Cardinals, uh, probably no thank you. Okay, moving on. We've spent a lot of time on those last two games, but I think it's warranted. They are the two t highest totals of the week. Uh, we could probably blast through this relatively quickly. New Orleans at San Francisco. Um, San Francisco's good, man. And it, it, this team's just really, really hard to peg. New Orleans is bad. Um also kind of a hard team to peg a little bit. Uh, where's most of the target share going to go and most of the the offensive productivity? Well, it's going to be Alvin Kamara, right, and Chris Olave. Chris Olave at 6,600. Uh, I think it's still a perfectly playable price. Andy Dalton had a really good week last week. If you want to get to some 5,300 Dalton and 6,600 Olave, I think that's perfectly fine. Um and throw in a, an Alvin Kamara as well. Now, you got to be careful because, uh, I mean, San Francisco is not going to give up anything on the ground. They're going to give up very little through the air. So the price tag might be a little elevated for Olave in that in that instance. Um, but 5,300 for Dalton kind of offsets that a little bit, uh, but would be careful. This is a markedly worse matchup. Um, when you get San Francisco's pass rush and pass defense here. So uh, Alvin Kamara at 7,300. I think this is really interesting. Um, he's probably going to see a good dump off share. And I think that's a lot of his value this week is probably going to come in the passing game. So I think this is an interesting play at uh, low ownership, 7% right now. I think you can, you know, if he fits, I wouldn't go out of my way to target him necessarily because the matchup is terrible um, just in general. But 7,300 at, at low ownership for a, uh, a pass-catching back, heavily involved in the offense, will get some rushing work still, I think is okay. Um, once again, we have to be careful of the Taysom Hill nonsense that they pull, uh, but Andy Dalton's performance last week is probably going to suggest that they leave Taysom Hill out a little bit. Um, and 
and try to rely a bit more on the passing game, but who knows? I mean, this is a terrible matchup. San Francisco's laying nine and a half right now. I made it a little bit lower just because, you know, nine and a half to 10 points in the NFL is, is pretty high. Um, especially when the total is only 43, but that said, San Francisco is a markedly better uh, football team than the Saints over here. So wouldn't be surprised if San Francisco also blows the doors off in New Orleans. Um, on the other side, this team is really, really hard to peg, as I said. Um, they've just got so many so many guys, and all of them are really, really good. Um, McCaffrey is probably going to get most of his work in the passing game, I would say. Um, he only got I mean, made seven carries or so, eight, ten carries, something like that, in this last week against Arizona. Um which is probably a little noisy in the in the fact that um, they were they were blowing out Arizona you know pretty quickly so um, didn't really need to leave him on the field necessarily Elijah Mitchell did get ten carries or, or whatever he got um, really productive I think it was about six and a half yards a carry so um, it's a dynamic to be aware of with McCaffrey and and Elijah Mitchell here um, Jimmy G at fifty six hundred not sure New Orleans is going to be scoring enough to warrant having to play or wanting to play Jimmy G. Um, that said, you know, against bad teams, we, we've seen that he could throw for four scores, no problem. Um, Debo and Brandon Ayuk are both playable uh, on their own. Once again, I would probably avoid full stacks here. It's just going to be hard because um, San Francisco just spreads the ball around. They're very, very balanced offense. So, um, George Kittle, I do like at 5,300 a pretty good bit. I think we could probably, if we're spending up for a tight end, we probably want to get to uh, Mark Andrews in the Baltimore game or even or even Kelsey. Um, he's probably a little expensive, but uh, Kittle at 53, healthy now, and we're seeing you know kind of a, a typical George Kittle workload. Uh, but once again, they got 17 dudes on this offense over here who – to whom they give the football, so uh, really hard to peg any one of them. If I had to choose, I'd probably stay off of McCaffrey at 88, and even though I, I love the kid, um, I think I would get to Kittle. He'd probably be my favorite. Uh, I would also consider some Elijah Mitchell in some deep tournament teams. Um, okay, last game of the day here. We should be able to go through this one pretty quickly. Uh, Rams at KC, I mean, who knows? Like, Stafford left this game again uh, with a concussion, so he'll, he's probably going to be out. It was uh, Bryce Perkins that came in. Um, he's 5,000. It doesn't really matter. You're not – I mean, you could play him, but I doubt the – I mean, the Rams are bad. This is a bad football team over here. It's really kind of shocking that they won the Super Bowl last year. Um, they have fallen off a cliff. Their offense is, is awful, and the only reason that they're not – you know, 0-26 right now is because their defense is actually kind of respectable. Um, and, of course, Cooper Cup. But out, without Cooper Cup now, uh, this offense is, is really, really going to struggle to move the football. It's certainly with a backup quarterback. So um, I wouldn't go anywhere near the Rams' offense outside of maybe a Tyler Higby at 4,200. think he's okay. Market kind of agrees there. Don't want to get crazy with that, but I think this is this is all right. Um, Allen Robinson, 55, probably just too expensive, but he is another deep tournament punt that you could consider just because of a, an elevated workload. Um, I'm not going near Van Jefferson or any of the other, or a Ben Skoranek, uh, or anything like that. And, and I'm totally staying off of the running game here. Um, I mentioned earlier that we are going to see the, the Chiefs defense steam, um, I mean, I like a 2,300 defense, and certainly when it's the Rams, I would play them normally, uh, but they're probably going to give up, you know, 30, 35 points this week, I would guess, and, and get pretty torn apart. Um, so I did mention Kansas City on the other side. We're going to see them steam really hard. And in early ownership runs, uh, we're seeing them push 15%. This is going to go up uh, by most accounts by the time we get to the weekend, 2,800. This is definitely your cash defense. Um, you can even play them in tournaments. I would cap your ownership, of course, but uh, at or cap your exposure rather. Uh, but a 2800 is a good price, a really, really good spot. Um, I would not be surprised if Kansas City gives up three points in this game. Um, offensively, that is going to make them very hard to stack. K 
can you get to Mahomes at 82 and Kelsey at 77? I mean, sure. But once again, you're going to need for, for these numbers to really get, get wild. Uh, you either need you know the Rams to score, which is super unlikely to happen, or you need Kansas City to just totally blow these guys out and and put up 35 points in the first half, which is possible. Uh, I think it's more likely that they do that than than it is the Chiefs give up a lot of points. Um, you know, so there's that. But I mean, do we really want to be targeting guys at these price tags? Mahomes at 82, Kelsey at 77. Uh, in a pretty suspect spot. I mean, they're laying a huge number. It's 14. I made it even higher. Um, you know, so, like, <laughs> they could very well win this game by three or four scores. Um, that said, if I am going to play some of the offense and just want to get some exposure to it, I would mix in some guys. Um, Travis Kelsey at 77, not my favorite, and I certainly hate playing him after he goes off for three touchdowns. Um, he's done that twice this season. And I think generally chasing that kind of performance is um, is pretty poor. And a 12% ownership is probably a bit too high. I'd rather just drop down and play Mark Andrews in a far better spot. Um, Juju, we have to be cognizant of where he is this week. Not sure if he's going to be healthy. Same thing with Kadarius Tony. He tweaked a hammy, I believe. Um, 4,900, that's unfortunate because I'd really like to play him uh, most often. But he's got an injury history, so we got to be careful with him. Um, I think my favorites would be MVS at 4,000 in the event that both Tony and Juju are out again. Um, would like some MVS. I think his workload would skyrocket. Probably not going to see all of the or both of those guys out, but if we do, uh, that puts Sky Moore in play as well at 3,000. And I wouldn't really say that you want to be playing a Fortson necessarily uh, on a full slate. Um, Though a 2,500 tight end, I mean, he's a stone man. Could do worse. Um, so that said, uh, Isaiah Pacheco is very clearly leading the running back room here. CEH has, has been nearly fully phased out. Um, they really like Isaiah Pacheco. So 5,500, I think this is a pretty good price. And it's 6% ownership. Um, even against a pretty decent run defense, I don't think this is bad at all. And he would be second to MVS as far as my favorite plays for the Chiefs go. Um, all right, so that's uh, that's pretty much it. Quickly, we'll go over stacks. Um, don't really like stacks necessarily in in the Houston-Miami game. Uh, you can play them for sure. Uh, would prefer one-offs kind of on, on both sides. Uh, do like the Cincy passing game. Definitely if Jamar Chase is back. Uh, you can also play some Tennessee passing game on the run back if you'd like. I uh, don't think that's bad at all, getting to some Traylon Burks or some um, some Nick Westbrook. Uh, I think those are both fine plays. Uh, but certainly the, the Cincinnati passing game in the, in the top three receivers there. Um, Baltimore and Jacksonville, again, not super crazy about full stacks here. Um, but you can play Lamar and, and Mark Andrews. That's definitely fine. Uh, you can also play some Trevor Lawrence and some maybe – some Zay Jones on the other side. Um, you can still consider Travis Etienne. Don't think that's bad at all. Um, just be aware that this, you know, Baltimore is a pretty good run defense, and the the pace in this game is probably going to be pretty slow. Um, Tampa and Cleveland like Tampa, and I think you can run it back with some Cleveland pieces. Cleveland and the Jets, I'm probably sta- or Chicago and the Jets rather. Uh, probably staying off of Chicago almost entirely. Probably doing the same with the Jets, focusing on mainly run game and defense here. Um, Atlanta and Washington like Washington for some hidden stack plays. Uh, I think this is one of the, you know, maybe four or five stacks that you could mix in this week. Uh, I think that's perfectly fine. Like running it back with some Drake London on the other side. Denver and Carolina, uh, I'm off the passing game this week for the most part. You can play them as one-offs. It's, it's just kind of whatever. Prefer the run games mostly and and like Denver's defense here a good bit. Um, Vegas and Seattle, I think these couple of games here are really what's going to decide the slate this week. Um, like all everybody here in, in the Vegas-Seattle game, you can play them all uh, and play some, play some good exposures with them. Um, once again, Chargers in Arizona – High total could be sneaky, and, and it could be kind of smoke and mirrors. 
Um, that said, I think there's some playable pieces for the Chargers, and yeah, maybe less so for Arizona, but uh, not totally um, ignorable, if you know, if you will. Um, New Orleans and San Francisco, you can stack San Francisco here for sure. Um, no idea who they're going to give the ball to, but it, it's going to be everybody. Um, so that makes it difficult. On the run back, you can play Kamara or Chris Olave, and you can get to some Chiefs as well. So it's kind of a um, a, a centralized sort of stack pool this week, if you will. But um, still plenty of spots that we can get different, like Washington uh, or a Tampa or something like that, um, with some 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 good plays in, in all the other games. So that's it for now, guys. Uh, once again, we've got a lot of noise in the projections so far. Um, keep an eye out for updates uh, as we move into the weekend, but once again, won't have anything for Thanksgiving. Um, just keep an eye out for uh, main slate pushes. So until then, um, we'll probably do a recording later on this week with Bobby um, and and discuss things a little bit more, but um, for now, that's that's kind of where we stand. So get different and, um, you know, but get convicted with some with some good plays. And I think there's some some good spots that we can really attack. So that's it. Uh, good luck.